Guys, I'm so excited to share this announcement with you all. Once Upon a Crime will, for the third year, be featured on Podcast Row at CrimeCon. CrimeCon, the world's largest and most fun true crime convention, will be held on May 1st through 3rd at the World Center Marriott in Orlando, Florida. Chock full of amazing true crime experts, investigators, journalists, celebrities, and podcasters, you will get to rub elbows with all the true crime royalty you follow on social media, watch in courtroom trials and on investigation shows and documentaries, and hang out each day with over a dozen true crime podcasters, including me. It is so much fun, and while it might seem early to be talking about it already, CrimeCon is a hot ticket and sells out. So don't wait to put it on your calendar and secure your registration. And if you register now, you'll lock in the lowest rate before prices go up. And in addition, if you use my special discount code, onceupon2020, you'll get 10% off your standard badge registration. So go to crimecon.com to register and use discount code onceupon2020 for 10% off your standard badge. Don't wait, hotel rooms always sell out and there's a special room rate right now as well. It's going to be a blast, and I can't wait to see you there. This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We've reached the last chapter in the series, Fugitives from Justice, where I detail stories of criminals on the run from the law. So far, I've told you two stories of men who sought to escape justice, and also about two female fugitives. For this last story, I'll tell you about the very first woman in history to make the FBI's 10 most wanted list. This is a story about the kidnapping of Barbara Jean Mackle and the fugitive, Ruth Eisman Shire. Gary Stephen Christ was a career criminal beginning at the age of nine. He started out shoplifting and stealing whatever he could get his hands on, whether it was something he needed or not. It wasn't about acquiring things or money, it seemed, but more for the thrill of getting away with something illegal. By the time Christ hit his early teens, he became obsessed with stealing cars. In Alaska in the late 1950s, most people left their keys in their car ignitions. Young Gary Christ took this as an open invitation to take the vehicle, use it as he wished, and then abandon it later. At the age of 14, he was caught and sent to a juvenile reform program in Ogden, Utah. He was a problem child while locked up, escaping briefly, during which time he stole another car. He eventually finished the program and was returned to Alaska. Christ was a good student and could have probably achieved his dream of attending medical school, but decided to go another way. Since first locked up at age 14, Christ always dreamed of committing the perfect crime. He thought up plans and details, whiling away the hours serving his time. College, it seemed, didn't hold the thrill for him that committing crimes did, and before classes began for his freshman year at the University of Utah, Chris stole a car and drove to Northern California. A few days after arriving, he abandoned the car with the telltale Utah plates and stole another one. But after he wrecked that stolen car, he was locked up again. Christ hadn't yet quite reached his 18th birthday, so served 14 months in a juvenile facility before being released. Now with time on his hands, he began to make solid plans to pull off his perfect crime. He settled on the idea of kidnapping someone with connections to a wealthy family so he could collect one large payoff and flee the country. When he was released, Chris reconnected with his brother, who was attending Stanford University. While living in Northern California, he met and married Carmen Simon. He was just 18 years old. But soon Chris began on another crime spree, stealing cars all over the San Francisco Bay Area. When he was caught, his wife was just a few months pregnant with their first son. Chris was sentenced to five years in prison. Eight months later, he escaped from prison and picking up his wife and son on the way out of town, made his way clear across the country, settling in Boston, Massachusetts. I've just begun listening to a great new podcast called Detective Trap. The new podcast, brought to you by Wondery and the Los Angeles Times, is hosted by award-winning journalist Chris Gofford, 
the voice behind Dirty John. In Detective Trap, you'll meet Detective Julissa Trap, an unconventional cop investigating a series of missing women's cases in Los Angeles. Julissa Trap is unconventional, not only because she is the only female homicide detective in an all-male department, but also because she'll stop at nothing to find answers for the victim's families and catch their loved one's killer. Follow along with Detective Trap on a real-life case to catch a suspected serial killer. I'm only on episode two, and I'm hooked. Julissa Trap is my new hero. I've included a special link in the show notes so you can go directly to the podcast, and I'll know you're listening along with me. While you're listening, make sure to subscribe to Detective Trap on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Gary Christ escaped from a five-year prison sentence for Grand Theft Auto and landed in Boston, where he began using the alias George Deacon. There he applied for a position as a research assistant at the prestigious university, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Bringing home a salary of $7,500 a year, or about $60,000 U.S. in today's dollars, Chris provided for his growing family. Carmen gave birth to a second son while they were living in Boston. Chris was a very intelligent person and liked to spend time in the university library studying textbooks and gaining the knowledge he had forfeited by choosing a life of crime. He was a quick study and could hold his own during intellectual discussions with students and even professors. However, his outsized ego often caused him to come across as cocky and rude. He was often aggressive and came into conflict with his co-workers and superiors at the university. Things became so strained that he started to grow paranoid someone would look into his past and credentials and discover that he was an escaped convict. He decided to pack up his family and move once more. In 1968, Chris landed in Florida. He, Carmen, and his two boys moved into a mobile home park in Miami. There he was hired by the University of Miami's Institute for Marine Research as a marine technician, working on the Institute's research vessels. His salary was even higher than his last position. He was now making $8,500 per year. Just a few months after landing in Florida, Christ was serving as part of the boat crew on a two-week research trip in the Bermudas with a group of graduate students. One of the students was a petite young woman named Ruth Eismannshire. Ruth's family were Austrian Jews who had fled Nazi Germany to escape persecution and made their home in Honduras. Ruth was very intelligent and spoke four languages. She had graduated from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, a prestigious public research university. She then moved to Florida to attend graduate school at the Institute for Marine Research. Ruth and Gary Christ began an affair while on the research trip. They continued the relationship after returning to Miami. Ruth was three years Christ's senior, and her intellect and worldliness appealed to him, as did the fact that she enjoyed sex as much as he did, something he'd often complained about as lacking in his marriage. Their attraction to each other was strong, and before long, Chris started sharing his ideas about pulling off the perfect crime with his lover. To his delight, Ruth was open to this interest of his as well. Within three months of meeting Ruth, Chris told his wife that he was no longer in love with her and wanted a divorce. It didn't take much convincing for Carmen to pack up her and her kids and move home to California. She was tired of bouncing around with her never-satisfied husband and just wanted a normal life. Within days of his wife's departure, Ruth had moved into the mobile home and she and Chris began planning his perfect crime in earnest. Chris had already decided that a kidnapping for ransom was the type of heist he thought would be most profitable. He began narrowing down his list of possible kidnap victims. He knew a family would pay a lot to get a child back, but young children would be too much hassle to care for, he thought. A male victim might provide more of a physical threat, so that was ruled out. A female victim would fit the bill best, he decided. Always a fan of libraries, Chris began spending time in a Miami library scouring social registers and the society pages of local newspapers. He was seeking to identify possible candidates for his kidnapping for profit scheme. He finally decided on someone he thought ticked all the boxes, the daughter of a wealthy land developer. Barbara Jane Mackle was a 20-year-old student attending Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Her father, Robert Mackle, and his two brothers, Frank Jr. and Elliot, had founded General Development Corporation, the largest land development company in Florida at that time. They had created the community of Deltona, Florida in the early 1960s, and were also credited with the development of Marco Island and Port St. Lucie, among other communities. Gary Christ discovered through newspaper accounts that Robert Mackle lived in a mansion in Coral Gables, was married and had two children, Robert Jr., 24, and Barbara, age 20. He also discovered that Mackle's company was valued at $65 million. Chris told Ruth it would be a cakewalk to get a measly half a million dollars out of Robert Mackle. All they had to do was kidnap his daughter Barbara from her college campus and hold her for ransom. Easy peasy. Chris figured he'd watched enough crime shows on television to figure out exactly what kidnappers got wrong, and his perfect crime would be planned down to the last detail, and all would go swimmingly. First, his victim would be an easy mark, he told Ruth. She was a young woman from a wealthy family who wasn't street smart or resourceful enough to foil his plan. He believed it would be easy enough to catch her unaware somewhere on the university campus and squire her away without calling attention to themselves. Second, he had figured out how to keep the girl under wraps and secure until the ransom was demanded and retrieved. It was part of his plan that his victim be returned alive. Chris thought it was less likely that a massive manhunt would occur if the girl was returned in good condition. They'd just be grateful she was home, he thought, and it would give them a better chance to flee the country as they intended. Chris, with the help of his girlfriend Ruth, continued to plan over the next three months. They decided that the days leading up to the Christmas holiday was the best time to put their plan into place. But from the beginning, there were problems. First of all, Emory University was in the midst of a flu epidemic in December of 1968. Christ was easily able to obtain the location of Barbara Mackle's dorm room on campus by posing as a scholarship investigator. Um, I don't think that's a thing. He should have actually went to college or done some research. But Barbara had been sick all week, and her mother Jane had taken her off of campus, where the flu was reaching epidemic numbers, to care for her. However, without much prodding, one of Barbara's dorm mates told the investigator that Barbara and her mother were staying at a nearby motel, the Roadway Inn. Geez, the Mackles were worth millions. Couldn't they have stayed in a more secure five-star hotel? But I digress. But Chris and Ruth were still confident they could pull off the kidnapping. Their plan just needed a little tweaking. Chris drove to the Roadway Inn to surveil the motel. There he was able to determine that Barbara Jean and her mother Jane were staying in room number 137. Barbara had come down with the flu that was spreading throughout the campus, but still wanted to complete her final examinations before the holiday break. Jane had come to town and booked a room for the two of them. She wanted a place to quarantine Barbara away from the campus to nurse her back to health before they traveled home together for Christmas. Chris saw that Jane was now an obstacle to kidnapping Barbara, but decided she could be subdued easy enough, so the plan moved forward. They needed a place to take their kidnap victim that would be safe and secure while they awaited the ransom payment. Chris came up with the idea to build a capsule equipped with everything that would be needed to keep Barbara hidden for a few days. He built this capsule in a trailer on the grounds of the University of Miami, where he was employed. It was roughly three feet wide, three and a half feet deep, and seven feet long, and was constructed of plywood with the interior lined with fiberglass. It had been fitted with steel brackets on its corners to make it strong, sturdy, and escape-proof. Inside the fiberglass box, they equipped it with three gallons of water, a makeshift waste receptacle, blankets, food in the form of candy bars, a fan, and two plastic pipes to let air in from the outside. After constructing this dungeon, Chris and Ruth loaded it into their Volvo station wagon and drove 12 hours north to a remote wooded area in Gwinnett County located about 20 miles, or 40 minutes, north of Emory University. There, they dug a hole big enough to bury the capsule. Jane Mackle and her daughter Barbara were roused from sleep at 4 a.m. on December 17, 1968, when someone knocked on the door of their motel room. Jane looked outside and saw a man wearing what appeared to be a police officer's cap. She didn't want to open the door, as she and Barbara were in their nightgowns, but the man addressed them by name 
and said that a young man driving a white Ford had been in an automobile accident and was asking for them. Stuart Woodward, Barbara's friend, drove a white Ford and had been by the room earlier that evening to check on Barbara. Now she believed he must have gotten into an accident after leaving the motel to return home. Concerned, Jane Mackle opened the door and was rushed by two individuals, Gary Crist brandishing a rifle, and Ruth Eisman Shire, who was dressed in men's clothing and wearing a ski mask. Jane Mackle was tied up, gagged, and had a chloroform rag placed over her face until she passed out. They then took Barbara, wearing only her flannel nightgown, and marched her to their car at gunpoint. They drove off with her into the night, traveling for more than half an hour, before finally turning off onto a bumpy dirt road and pulling over into the woods. As they stopped the car, Chris turned to the terrified Barbara and told her, I guess you know why we're here. We're kidnapping you. They then led her to the pre-dug hole in the ground and instructed her to get into the box and lie down. Terrified at the idea of being buried alive, Barbara begged and pleaded with her kidnappers not to put her in the box, repeating again and again, I'll be good, I'll be good. Christ, ignoring her pleas, instead explained in detail the features of the coffin-like box. He seemed very proud of his creation. Christ also assured Barbara she would not be harmed, but would remain in the box until they retrieved the ransom from her father. She continued to cry and beg them not to put her in the hole, and Christ and Ruth finally had to subdue her by putting a chloroform-soaked rag over her face. She grew groggy, but didn't pass out. She would later remember vividly every detail of being placed underground. She was laid inside the box, and her kidnappers wanted to take away photographic proof that they were holding Barbara and she was alive. They forced her to hold a piece of cardboard in front of her with the word kidnapped crudely written on it. They took out a Polaroid camera and snapped a picture. However, they didn't like that she was crying and looked distressed in the photo. So they forced her to smile for a second photo. The picture is a bizarre piece of crime history, with young Barbara appearing to be lying in a coffin, her dark hair spilled out around her head, with a nauseated half-smile plastered on her face. The terrified girl then listened as her kidnappers fastened the lid of the box down with over a dozen screws, and then the sound of earth being thrown on top of her. In a book Barbara Mackle co-wrote with Miami Herald journalist Jean Miller, titled 83 Hours Till Dawn, she describes what happened next. I started screaming and pounding to try and get out. With my fists, I hit the walls as hard as I could. With all my strength, I braced and pushed. I was screaming, God, no, you can't leave me. After some time spent in panic, Barbara wore out her strength, already weakened by her illness. She tried to calm herself enough to take in her surroundings and figure out how she might survive this ordeal. Incredibly, she found a long typed letter of information and instructions from her captors which read in part, Do not be alarmed. You are safe. You are presently inside a fiberglass reinforced plywood capsule, buried beneath the ground near the house in which your kidnappers are staying. Your status will be checked approximately every two hours. The capsule is quite strong, and you will not be able to break it open. Be advised, however, that you are beneath the water table. If you break open a seam, you would drown before we could dig you out. None of this information was true. The kidnappers were not staying nearby, nor did they check on her after leaving her. She was buried under clay-like dirt, and there was no danger of drowning. It continued. Your life depends on the air delivered to your chamber via the ventilation fan. This fan is powered by a lead-acid storage battery capable of supplying the fan motor with power for 270 hours. This detail was also miscalculated. The fan battery quit after only about three or four hours. Your capsule contains a water jug with three gallons of water and a tube from which to drink. Barbara's kidnappers did not include the information that sedatives had been placed into the drinking water. Blankets and a mat are provided. A case of candy is provided to furnish energy to your body. Tranquilizers are provided to aid you in sleeping, the best way you have to pass the time. We're sure your father will pay the ransom we have asked for in less than one week. When your father pays, we will tell him where you are, and he'll come for you. Should he fail to pay, we will release you. So be calm and rest. You'll be home for Christmas one way or the other. The holiday season is upon us, and while it can be a fun time, it can also cause added stress. Crowded malls, increased traffic, the strain on your budget. 
So when I learned about the therapeutic benefits of CBD, cannabinoid-infused products, to help calm anxiety and reduce stress, I was intrigued. Then I tried Onyx and Rose CBD products, and I was sold. Onyx and Rose offers premium CBD products, including oils, capsules, bliss bombs, bath bombs, even products for your pets. CBD is one of the many chemical compounds found in hemp that naturally interact with receptors in the body to produce therapeutic benefits for the mind and body, including reducing stress and even alleviating sleepless nights. With everything I have to do, sometimes I have a hard time falling or staying asleep. I've begun using Onyx and Rose Zero THC CBD capsules to help me get a restful night's sleep. And no, these products will not get you high. But I just take one or two capsules before bed and it relaxes my mind and body enough to help me drift off easily. All Onyx and Rose products are made with 100% American and organically grown hemp, are third-party tested, and they post all their lab reports to give customers peace of mind. As a listener of this podcast, you can try Onyx and Rose products for yourself and save 15% off by visiting onyxandrose.com once and use offer code once at checkout. You must be 18 or older and live in the U.S. to take advantage of this offer. That's Onyx and Rose, O-N-Y-X-A-N-D-R-O-S-E dot com slash once to learn more about their full selection of CBD oils, capsules, bliss bombs, bath bombs, and pet products. Don't forget to use offer code once at checkout to save 15% off your first purchase. We love our pets and want to keep them healthy and happy. And one of the best ways to keep your pets healthy and thriving is to feed them solid gold pet foods. Solid Gold was the first holistic pet food company in America. Since 1974, its founder discovered that over 80% of our pet's immune system was influenced by gut health. Solid Gold pet foods were created to support a healthy digestive system that positively impacts the overall wellness of our pets. Solid Gold has recipes for both dog and cat's dietary needs, including whole grain and grain-free options, wet foods, and supplements like sea meal, and 100% human-grade bone broth, which isn't easy to say, but my dogs love it and it makes their tum-tums healthier, which makes me and Bugsy and Riley very happy. Solid Gold Pet Foods cleanse the digestive system with whole superfoods, balance with living probiotics, and fuel with omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, supporting gut health and nourishing your pet inside and out. Right now, Solid Gold is offering our listeners 30% off your first order by visiting solidgoldpet.com once. That's Solid Gold Pet dot com slash once for 30% off your first order. And thanks for supporting this show. Gary Christ and Ruth Eismanshire had taken 20-year-old Barbara Mackle at gunpoint and buried her in a capsule underground in the woods north of Georgia. They then moved on to the second part of their plan, to demand a ransom for her safe return. About five hours after Barbara's abduction, her father, Robert Mackle, received a phone call at his home in Coral Gables, Florida. The caller told him to look for the ransom note hidden on his property. It was found under a rock, and the instructions told Mackle to gather $500,000 in cash, specifically in $20 bills that were not numbered sequentially. $500,000 in 1968 is the equivalent of approximately $3.5 million today. Mackle was told that if he accepted the terms of the ransom, to place a classified ad in the next morning's paper that read, Loved one, please come home. We will pay all expenses and meet you anywhere at any time. Your family. Which Mackle did. The FBI were called in on the kidnapping case, and on December 19th, intercepted a letter addressed to Mackle's home. Inside was a gold ring belonging to his daughter, along with the Polaroid picture the kidnappers had taken of Barbara lying in the box. Mackle gathered the $500,000 in cash, and in the very early morning hours of the 19th, he was instructed to take the money in a suitcase to the end of Fair Isle Street in Miami and leave it in a box marked with a flashing light. Mackle went to the location where he was directed and left the money, but was unable to find either a box or a flashing light. An hour later, Chris again called the Mackle home, and the phone was answered by Frank Mackle, Barbara's uncle. The kidnapper complained that the money had not been left where instructed. Frank Mackle assured him that his brother had gone to the drop location. Yet another part of Chris's plan did not go as expected. The money was to be dropped along a seawall, where nearby, Chris was waiting in a small boat on the bay, watching for Mackle. 
as soon as he saw the money dropped and Mackle retreat, he'd planned to run to the shore, take the money, and be picked up by Ruth and the Volvo to make their escape. But Mackle had not left the money on the seawall, but further down in the woods. Christ and Ruth had to search the area on foot to find the suitcase. When they finally did, and began to emerge from the woods to return to their car, two Miami police officers happened to observe the couple while on their regular patrol duty. Wondering what anyone was doing in the vicinity at that time of the morning, and suspecting they might be burglars, the cops called for the couple to halt. They both ran, dropping the heavy suitcase and fleeing on foot. The area was searched by the police, and the abandoned Volvo was located. It yielded a lot of very incriminating information, including Ruth's passport, the first Polaroid picture taken of Barbara after her kidnapping, two airline tickets to Las Vegas, a room key for the roadway inn in Decatur, and a blank sheet of paper that had been in the typewriter, placed behind the one the ransom note had been typed upon. The suitcase, filled with $500,000 in cash, was also identified as being the ransom demanded of Robert Mackle. Mackle was devastated, believing he'd just lost his one and only chance to save his daughter's life. The afternoon after the botched ransom retrieval, Chris took a cab to the Miami airport and rented another vehicle. He and Ruth had run in separate directions after almost being caught with the ransom money. She had boarded a bus for Texas, while Chris stayed behind to arrange a second money drop. They planned to meet up in Texas and then board a flight for Europe once he'd collected the ransom. At 10.30 p.m. on December 19th, almost three days since kidnapping Barbara, Christ called a priest at the Church of the Little Flower, a Catholic church in Coral Gables, and relayed instructions to forward to Robert Mackle about a second money drop. This time, Mackle sent a friend to drop the money in the specified location. The money was left according to instructions, and Christ was able to retrieve it without incident this time. By now, however, the FBI knew the name of the female kidnapper and the alias of the male kidnapper, Christ was still going by George Deacon since his prison escape, along with several other aliases. However, they didn't know where to locate either of them. The next decision Christ would make would be his undoing. The morning after walking away with over $500,000 in cash, Gary Christ entered a boat store in West Palm Beach and purchased a boat and motor making the purchase with $2,200 in cash, in $20 bills to be specific. His plan was to escape by boat through the Florida canals and then continue across the Gulf of Mexico to meet up with Ruth in Texas. But the details of the kidnapping, ransom, and payment had already been reported in the media, and the owner of DND Marine, Norman Oliphant, became suspicious of the customer who identified himself as Arthur Horowitz. Oliphant decided to call the police as soon as the man left the building. Chris still hadn't called the Mackles to give them information on where to find their daughter. Finally, 15 hours after he'd picked up the ransom money and about an hour after purchasing the boat, Chris finally made good on his promise. He called the FBI office in Atlanta and left somewhat vague directions to where Barbara Mackle could be found buried in the woods outside of Duluth, Georgia. Agents and police descended on the area and began searching a large area on foot. Meanwhile, at 10.30 that morning, Coast Guard helicopters carrying FBI agents spotted Christ's boat in the water near Fort Myers. Christ, realizing he was being followed, beached the boat on Hog Island and ran into the swampy jungle of mangroves. There was no way off the island, and agents and officers surrounded it by land and air, but he still didn't give himself up. Only after attempting to run through the jungle to escape the dragnet was he finally caught 12 hours later and arrested. $17,000 was found in his pockets, and another $480,000 was found on the boat. In the woods outside of Duluth, officers knew they may be running out of time to find Barbara alive, if in fact she hadn't already succumbed to being buried underground. More than 100 officers searched the woods, and the task seemed almost impossible. Then about 4 p.m. on December 21st, an agent spotted two PVC pipes sticking out of the ground. Calling the missing girl's name into the pipe, 
He heard her weak but frantic cry, I'm here, I'm here, don't leave me. Digging with their hands, it took officers 12 minutes to dig up the earth to reach the buried box. All the while, they continued to assure the panicked and delirious-sounding young woman that they wouldn't leave her and promised she'd be home with her family for Christmas. Finally, they reached the lid and pried it open. Several tough FBI agents and experienced officers would later admit that they broke down in tears when they lifted the grateful and sobbing young girl from her tomb. She was dehydrated and weak and had lost 10 pounds over the 83 hours of her ordeal, but she was alive. And Ruth Eismanshire, while she escaped by bus and would not be heard from again until many months later when she would also make a rookie mistake. While her lover and partner in crime was captured less than 24 hours after he was identified, Ruth would disappear, without any of the half million dollars in ransom, but with her freedom, at least for a while. Boarding a bus, Ruth got as far as Oklahoma. There she settled in the town of Norman, going by the alias Donna Sue Wills. On December 28, 1968, Ruth Eisenshire was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list, becoming the first woman in history to earn that distinction. She lived quietly, taking menial jobs to support herself until she could find a way to return to Honduras, and most likely out of the reach of the law forever. But Ruth made a mistake that would finally bring her to justice. She applied for a job at Central State Hospital in Norman, which required her to be fingerprinted. Her fingerprints, found in the abandoned Volvo, had already been placed on file with the FBI. When her application was being reviewed and her fingerprints were run, they were flagged as belonging to the fugitive Ruth Eismanshire. On March 5, 1969, FBI agents traveled to Oklahoma and arrested her on charges of kidnapping for ransom and unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Two months later, she pled guilty to the charges and was given a seven-year prison sentence. After two years, she was released on the condition that she returned to Honduras and could no longer enter the United States. She is now 76 years old and lives in Honduras and, according to her Facebook page, has five children and practices homeopathic medicines and therapies specializing in treatments for the ailments of elderly patients. And Gary Chris's story was far from over. He faced possible execution for his crime, but in part, due to Barbara Mackle's willingness to forgive her kidnappers, he was sentenced to life instead. Barbara told the court that she was grateful that Chris had spared her life by calling the FBI to report where she could be found, as he had promised. Chris spent his time in prison crowing about his superior intellect, refusing to concede that his perfect crime had been a major flop. Alternately, he spent his time doing his best to manipulate his way out of prison. In this endeavor, he succeeded. After a failed attempt to escape from prison a second time, this time in a garbage truck, he tried a more subtle approach to be sprung from prison. First, he wrote a long and apologetic letter to Barbara Mackle, taking responsibility for the crime and calling it evil and immoral. He also wrote an autobiography titled Life to explain his sorry past and attempt to convince the public that he was a man ready to make amends and live an upstanding and honest life. But his most successful ploy was working his way into the good graces of prison doctors, the teachers who ran the college classes he took while incarcerated, and even the chairman of the Georgia Parole Board. Parole was much more liberally granted in those days, and even lifers could be found eligible for parole after only seven years. Christ wasn't so lucky. He had to serve an entire decade before being granted parole. He walked out of prison at the age of 33. Incredibly, in their decision to grant Christ parole, the board said that his crimes, in their opinion, were not violent or dangerous. The chairman of the parole board, Tommy Morris, was quoted as saying, The fact is, his victim did live and is totally recovered, unquote. He went on to say that Chris's victim, Barbara Mackle, quote, suffers no lasting trauma from the ordeal. Therefore, the net result is that little harm was done, unquote. Oh, really? 
Someone should place him in a coffin underground for three and a half days and see if he has any lasting trauma. As for Barbara Mackle, except for the book she co-authored about her kidnapping, she has never given any interviews or spoken about her ordeal in public. She would later marry Stuart Woodward, the friend who had visited her earlier on the day of her abduction. They have two children and live in Florida. Her book, 83 Hours Till Dawn, was published in 1971. In 1972, ABC Television aired a movie of the week based on her book titled The Longest Night. A second television movie about the Barbara Mackle kidnapping was aired in 1990 and also titled 83 Hours Till Dawn. Gary Christ went on to live a pretty interesting life, one filled with both achievements and more criminal acts. He attended medical school and practiced medicine in West Virginia and Indiana before his license was revoked for allegations of misconduct. In 2006, he was arrested off the coast of Alabama, trying to bring a shipment of cocaine into the U.S., worth a reported $1 million. In 2007, he was sentenced to five years in prison for this crime. But there's one other strange and chilling detail to Gary Christ's story. While in jail awaiting his trial for kidnapping, Christ made another confession. He had murdered not once, but several times, committing his first murder while still in his teens, he said. In total, Christ said he had committed four murders. Was it possible that Gary Christ was a serial killer? Or was this just another way to gain attention and make himself appear to be a master criminal who got away with murder? I'll be sharing the rest of this story on an upcoming Patreon bonus episode. To hear that extra episode and 20 other bonus episodes, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to become a patron. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. This week we will celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday in America... And I just want to take this time to thank each and every one of my listeners for coming back week after week to listen to my true crime stories. I also want to thank you for telling your friends about the podcast, rating and reviewing the show, following me on social media, and of course, supporting the show by visiting our sponsors and becoming Patreon members. Thank you all so much from the bottom of my heart. In December, I have some really special holiday episodes lined up, and I can't wait to share them with you. Please subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening now so you don't miss an episode. Looking for a great holiday gift for someone special or for yourself? Don't forget, you can already purchase your Crime Con tickets and join me for the greatest true crime convention in the world. I hope you'll use my discount code to get 10% off your standard badge and then visit me on Podcast Row in Orlando, Florida on May 1st through 3rd, 2020. Go to crimecon.com and use discount code once upon 2020. Until next time, be good to one another. Mm-hmm.